Welcome to Leverage Women Podcast, where we equip, inspire, and connect women in the leadership that God has called them to. Welcome to the Leverage Podcast. I'm so excited to be with my friends today. This is such a treat for me to hear from amazing people who have blessed my life so much, and I know that our conversation is going to bless your heart. Uh, so I am not going to introduce them. They're going to actually introduce themselves. And I'm going to start off with Melinda Estabrooks. Tell us a little bit about you, what you do, your family, ministry, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, really quickly, uh, from the very beginning, I was adopted as a little baby in an orphanage in Quezon City, right outside of Manila by Canadian missionary family. Uh, so just a beautiful story of growing up in the Philippines and Singapore and then coming to Canada in the late 80s and that whole journey. So that's a bit of the background for me. Currently, I'm in a blended family uh, with my husband, Chris, and our two kids, Nathan and Sophie, Nathan 15, Sophie 13. And so these are, for Chris and I, this is our second marriage. And so that's been an interesting journey too of challenge and, and adventure being a blended family. And currently I'm the host and executive producer of a women's talk show called See Here Love, which is the only women's show that's on all media platforms, uh, broadcast television, podcast, radio, uh, video on demand, YouTube, and online. So I'm a storyteller, I'm a speaker, and I love hanging out with my girlfriends on patios in the sunshine. <laughs> So that's me. That's me in a nutshell. Um, but I've been doing this kind of work for like 25 years in broadcast advocacy, fundraising and PR. So that's a bit of my background. Amazing. And mm. Ellen Graf Martin, we've been building friendship for my goodness. It feels like five, five years almost. Four, five years. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, tell us about what you do, who you are. I am a West Coast kid who lives in small town, rural Ontario, um, with my husband and my daughter, who is seven. Um, and I get to lead the team at Graf Martin Communications, the agency that I built starting in 2008, which is, it's going to be 12 years this fall. And so I get to do that previous to this work, um, which I absolutely love and which really actually has fueled what I get to do. Um, I was a missionary and I worked um, as a national marketing manager for a major organization. And so in here in Canada, and I've worked and lived in a number of places. I've lived in the US, uh, in Georgia, a small town Georgia. I went from Nanaimo, BC to small town Georgia, which is so weird. Um, and I have lived in Central America and in Germany and um, on a ship <laughs> and then moved to Ontario. And I've stayed in the same house in Ontario. My parents never believed that this would happen, but I've stayed in the same house for 10 years now, 10 and a half years. So in a small town, such a weird thing, but this is what I get to do. And we work with um, nonprofit organizations, specifically Christian organizations that are doing incredible things around the world for justice and freedom and poverty alleviation um, and Bible teaching and marriage support. Like we really get to work with so many incredible things. Um, and, and that's our mission is to help organizations communicate what God is doing around the world and to find ways to join him in doing that. So and tell me about your family, because I know this is really exciting. Yeah. About my family? <laughs> yes, Carly. Oh. <laughs> well, Carly, my daughter, is supposed to be on Nathaniel's um, podcast. So she's working on her content for that. And she's, my son has a podcast, guys. <laughs> yeah. My life is exciting right now, because I'm trying to lead a team through change. Um, homeschool alongside my husband, a kid who normally has support at school with an EA, and um and has adhd so she lives life with adhd which is very exciting all the time and so, <laughs> so she ha has the best attitude wakes up so happy and excited every single morning which you know when you're together 24 7 is really a lot <laughs> so <laughs> These are the exciting times right now. We are going to be talking about embracing change. This is our topic for this podcast. But Cheryl, tell us about you. Tell us you know, a little bit about your family history, uh, ministry work, all of that good stuff. 
I'll give you the, the quick version because I have moved around a lot as well. So I have never lived on a ship, Ellen. I don't okay. Think, I'd love to hear that story. Life goals, I tell you. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm a BC born and bred, so I've lived uh, in BC kind of off and on most of my life. But um, I'm married 41 years, so I'm definitely the, the elder on this panel. Uh, 41 years, same man. And we have two grown sons who are both married, and we have four lovely grandchildren. All of us live currently within eight blocks of each other. Mm -hmm. And so we've, um, we've met, we actually agreed in this COVID crisis to, to um, isolate together. So the agreement was we all, all six of the adults work from home. The agreement was we couldn't have any outside contact other than our family. And we felt like that was safe. So we've been super, super isolated from everyone except our family. So that's been really fun. Um, I was 25 years in the broadcast industry, television news, primarily with CTV, but um, ended up working with all of the networks at one point or the other. Did a women's talk show for a while, Melinda. So I, um, I appreciate what you do. It's magnificent to watch that you bring the faith component in because I, I did mine for um, the Life Network. So it wasn't a faith-based oh. show. Um, and then I worked for a while as uh, the director of the Op Operation Christmas Child. So the, the Shoebox campaign, did that for a while. So I, uh, Ellen, with you, share a heart for kind of what we can do globally. And then the last 15 years of our life, Neil and I, my husband, Neil and I have been called into marriage ministry. So we went kind of out of the blue. We got called to this huge church in California to be their marriage pastors. I'd never done it before. I was, you know, on air September 29th and October 1st, I started as a marriage pastor. So God was up to some crazy things. But anyway, uh, it was, a, it was an obedience call, which has grown into a huge passion. And so now Neil and I currently lead Family Life Canada and the One Conference, but primarily our focus is on Family Life Canada. So there you go. That's it. That is not it. There are so, much, there's so many layers to this. It's so incredible. This, all this experience and wisdom gathered on this call, it's, it's just incredible. Um, I want, to, I want to really lean into this conversation of how we've adapted to change and needed to adapt to change in our lives because uh, it filters it from our personal life into how we lead our family and how we lead teams. And so how have you had to adapt to change? Um, Cheryl, let's start with you over the last, let's say, five years. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, I was thinking about this today. I was thinking in the last in the last five years, I've transitioned quite deliberately to trying to be kind of less, less hands-on in what I do and more empowering of the people around me, all of whom are younger than me. <laughs> and I was trying to think this morning whether that was an age thing. Um, I'm 61, so is that an age thing? I'm winding down my uh, active years. So, but I actually don't think so. I think what it is, it's more kind of the life of your leadership. And so I think at about the um, we've been now leading family life for 10 years. I think about the five year mark, you should start thinking about making yourself redundant. And so over the last five years, I've been kind of slowly handing off more and more leadership and really trying to equip my younger leaders. And so it's been change for them, change for me, um, but good change in, in, in a lot of ways. Well, Ellen, what about the change that you've embraced over the last year? Yeah. <laughs> I am one of those people who lives in a perpetual state of change. And that's just the way God has had our life. I look at people whose lives are very stable and just kind of stay the same. And I think, wow, that looks amazing <laughs> because God just is always kind of stretching us. And, um, and over the last year, it's been interesting to me because I've been similar to Cheryl. I've been trying to, work myself into the role that God has for me and not trying to do all the things. And so learning what to say no to, learning what to say yes to, um, learning limitations with just the, the demands of my personal life and my work life and understanding what it looks like to do the right thing and not just all the things. <laughs> and, and so and what, what is actually my responsibility? And one of my friends, Elizabeth had said, it's about, um, 
figuring out which balls that you're juggling are crystal and which ones are rubber. So which ones do you really need to juggle and which ones can roll into the corner? And so embracing that um, and letting other people in to co-lead and to lead alongside me in new ways and different ways, which is honestly just something that God has provided for. And so, you know, when we started 2020, our organization was looking at a brand refresh for ourselves and re-envisioning our mission and vision and getting extreme clarity around mission and vision. So having a mission that I was more excited about than what I had imagined um, 11 years ago. And now I've seen that, you know, even over the last two months, that it's just accelerated. <laughs> so, so all of the changes, I think part of it is just holding on <laughs> and saying, okay, God, what are you doing and what is next? And my word of the year is stepping through. And I feel like God has asked me to step through into a lot of new things. And so being open to that has been the story of the last year. Wow. And Mel, what about you within the last year, three and three months? Because I think that a lot of change has happened for you in the last three months. You know, and twofold, I think work and personal. So for someone like me, high output, productivity, control freak, likes the plan. I mean, I'm moving into budgets right now and it's hilarious because I'm like, how do you budget for fiscal uh, new year? And you have no idea what is going to happen because of, you know, COVID-19. I think the biggest um, adapting for me, Anne, has been I've had to take life now one day at a time. It's an interesting thing because I'm always a planner. I always have, you know, the big rollout, know what's going to happen in two months, six months, eight months, from vacation to studio audience to conferences. That's my world is conferences, events, engagement with people. When that's taken away and you're like, whoa what do I have to do? It's like, you can only do what you can do that day because everything's changing all the time. So it's been huge for someone who's extroverted, married to an introverted husband. Uh, that's been a very, very big change on how we have to work together in the home. Uh, not going out to the office in a studio with people has been a big personal change for me where I've had to be inside. So that's been some, you know, just challenge even with sort of my mental health and how to how as an extrovert to like exert energy and get filled up when I'm not with people. As much as I'm trying to like grab onto my husband, he's like, Melinda, I'm an introvert. You can't be all into just me. <laughs> so that's been a, you know, uh, an interesting journey for me, but it's good. It's been so hard, but it's been really good to sort of adapt in a way to go one day at a time, do what I can today and not worry about tomorrow, which you know what, I think is a biblical principle yeah. and I've actually needed to learn. And now I'm actually really learning it now. It's been so interesting to see how, you know, our world uh, has responded to this season of change, like forced change uh, yeah. that has been imposed on everyone from things that, you know, people are learning how to cook that haven't cooked before or yeah, Melinda, as you, <laughs> so funny. I've like, before, really. Yeah. Yeah, what recipe have you tried? <laughs> well, I've actually gone back to my Filipino roots and I'm making like chicken adobo and different like oh. Filipino things. And listen, I'm telling you, I never cook. Ellen would know. I mean, it was takeout. Mm -hmm. It was always going out three times a week. And now I'm saving tons of money and I'm actually enjoying the process of cooking. There's something that's coming out of me about how fun it is. And I never thought it would be fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's just fascinating for me to watch like people actually Instagramming, you know, making bread. I'm like, my mom would have never advertised that she's been making bread her whole life. Right? Or, or friends rushing around and sending the starter to people. It's just, it's quite awesome to watch how we're getting back to some things that maybe we didn't even prioritize before we didn't care about. But it's, it seems to be that because of, of this, this season that we're in, um, they say, I don't know who they are, but there's this quote out there that necessity is the mother of innovation. And so what's come about for you that's been birthed or created because of the necessity? How have you seen yourself become more creative and innovative? Like, yes, the cooking part, but what about in your ministries right now? Cheryl, what about you? What have you, have you launched something? Yeah. Yeah. Mostly what we've done has been face-to-face -face ministry face-to-face -face conferences across the country. So we right. can't travel, we can't gather. 
so our ministry really ground to a halt in, in that way. But back to what you said, Alan, at, at the beginning of this year, we had agreed that we needed to be more, have more of a digital online presence. And we were going to commit to doing that this year. <laughs> Uh, so what we plan to do over, you know, 12 months, we've done over three weeks, basically tried to shift a, an entire ministry online. So it's taken some, here's, here's the biggest thing that helped me. Somebody early on said, don't worry about being excellent. Um, let's be, let's be quick, not excellent. And for a person who kind of prides excellence and um, prizes excellence, I, that was probably the most freeing thing. So we just decided to launch off and, you know, everything worth doing is worth doing badly. So let's do it. <laughs> and, uh, what it, what it's done for our whole team is really, as you said, accelerate what we were already going to do, but it's, uh, it's been exciting. It's been exhausting. Uh, we've made lots of mistakes, but we're getting there. So we, um, we've shifted to online conferences and online webinars and we're, um, and a podcast, which we've never done before. And so ministry life has really changed. What's the name of your podcast, Cheryl? It's called the Family Life Canada Podcast. And um, that's been really fun. It's, it's really been fun for me. I, well, I love to interview Melinda. That's partly my, my thing, too. I've, I've just, that was my favorite part of broadcasting was somebody gave me permission and actually paid me to ask the questions that I wanted to ask anyway. It was awesome. And um, <laughs> I think a podcast gives you that permission again to do yeah I love it that's so awesome Ellen now you're very familiar with this online community I feel like you've been cutting edge in, in before COVID hit you are already online you you engaged in the resources how have things kind of shifted for you and and given you like a creative outlet What's been birthed in this season? <laughs> well, one of the things that I am not lacking are creative outlets. I'm actually, so we've had to take my art studio in my basement and turn it into my office. So I just can't, I don't want to come back here in the evening to do other creative things because I've been here all day. Um, but I think, you know, honestly, what it has meant for me is that I've had to get better at my craft mm -hmm. because I think we're a little bit under a microscope right now. Um, and we have to get better. You can cover up a lot of things when you're in person, but there are some, some ways you, you, when we're doing these one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's harder. It's harder to do creative thinking together when you can only have one person speaking at a time. You don't realize how much we actually count on overspeak. <laughs> so we have to become better communicators just by doing this. Um, and for me, my, the big thing I've been doing is a lot of learning on. Um, fundraising and crisis uh, for our clients because I, you know, we write fundraising letters for a lot of organizations and try to make them enormously authentic. And so really trying to hone in on brand and communication um, from that perspective and also just best practices, building fresh best practices, which is really hard to say, uh, ironic <laughs> because of the first point. And I think the other part is just saying, okay, how do we take what we already do and make it digital? Just like Cheryl said. And I know Melinda is doing the same thing. So we are doing, um, we love getting together with organizations and helping them re redo their brand. And so we actually had two organizations coming to our office in April and May from across the U.S. and Canada and uh, to, to do their brand. And now we have to figure out how to do that and how to facilitate real conversation and building something with teams that are so spread out and so this is a brand new thing for us but in building it it will allow us to serve so many more organizations that potentially wouldn't have the resources to fly everyone to Ontario or to one spot so we're innovating and I, I all honestly I feel like this is a startup again that's how it feels. I feel like I'm running a startup again. Um, but this time with people on payroll and um, a child who, and a husband. <laughs> I had a husband before, but, you know, we were new at the time. So it was, you know, we were okay to be apart. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's different. Uh, it's a really weird season that way. Mel. I know you've had to be creative and innovative and what has been birthed in this, mm -hmm. the last month or so? 
you know, there are so many things. I think what Cheryl and Ellen are saying are right in what happened with us. You know, I'm a content creator. And, you know, funny enough, we had actually finished our season and we were the last studio audience event to actually put on an, uh, an event with people in the studio before COVID-19 came in and everything was shut down. So it was an amazing moment for us. So we actually had finished our original tapings and we were going to go into reruns. Well, when COVID-19 hit, it was like, wait a second, we now have opportunity because all of our guests are now at home and we have access to people all over the world that we never had access to before. One of the biggest challenges for us was that we were always having to get people up to the studio and it was always like trying to figure out their schedule. Now there was no schedule. Everybody was home and we could access them. So that was really great. So we were actually really, you know, this is our time. We were calling, this is our jam. This is our moment. We're content creators. We're going to do it. What happened though, was then everybody in the world became a content creator. I'm not kidding. It was like every single person, whether you're on TikTok, whether you're doing Facebook lives, whether you're doing Zoom calls, like everybody all of a sudden said, hey, here's my opportunity to be a content creator. So we were then forced to look and go, wait a second. Now we're competing with everybody. Everybody's having access to everybody. What, is, what are we going to do to, to be unique? And I really think what happened is we, as a team, had to sit back and go, what are we about? And we're about giving everyday women a platform to share their story. We're not going to compete with other people and other things. They're doing their thing. We have to do ours. So we started doing that. And just what Cheryl and, and Ellen were saying, we started doing webinars and, and online shows and then we started feeling that people st were beginning to have this fatigue for Zoom calls and online content. Like it was crazy. It was like, everybody was like, yeah, we're for it. Everybody was on these things. And then we're finding sort of a shift where people are like, I'm tired and exhausted about being online or being constantly in front of people, my face right in a screen and not with people. So it has been challenging, Anne. It is it's been highs and lows, this roller coaster of emotions and creativity constantly because you're looking at what's out there, wanting to create good content, hearing from people they're tired, they don't want to sign up for your webinar. Not, you know, nothing personal, Melinda, we're just tired. And so we're just continuing to say, okay, God, how are we gonna be creative, faithful in what you're doing? So I mean, what's exciting is, you know, we're looking at now going across Canada with our coast to coast conversations with and you know, as a co-host with See Here Love. We're looking at smaller webinars, more specific, but you know, at the end of the day, I am, I, I also want to be careful too, that I don't exhaust myself with trying to run with the pack and do everything um, when it's honestly not necessary and it's not really what I should be doing. So yeah, I'm in an interesting moment right now. You caught me into this moment this week of like content creation overload, but also content creation and what I should be doing, what God is calling me to do and staying in sort of my lane and what God is doing versus going all over the place and going crazy. So that's where I'm at. Melinda, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is to try to figure out and really discern what is helpful and what is uh, rather not just something that's contributing to the noise. Right. Sometimes we don't need any more noise online, and we, we, but there are specific needs. And so kind of really, I think I, I'm with you. Initially, we just kind of reacted with kind of, um, panic almost like we got to we got to get on this bus uh and then slowly we started to just kind of no 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 take a deep breath we're still about the same things and how do we actually help people instead of just adding more volume to their lives so there's a huge discernment piece and you have to slow down to discern and so that you know if, if you find yourself slowing down these days for a little bit to kind of take a breath I think that's pretty normal yeah and actually pr probably pretty healthy yeah. And I think the tired is real. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone is tired. And we are now heading into, like, like someone said this to me at the very beginning of all of this, and I think it's so wise. And so it's been my perspective. I've been looking at this situation as 90 day sprints. So the first 90 days, what does that look like? And we're actually coming up on the end of the first 90 days soon, which is crazy, but we're just a few weeks away from that. So what does it look like at the end of that? And then we're going to be into a new 90 day sprint. So what does the new normal look like? Because the last three months are not normal, but there is a new normal emerging and we're tired going into it. It's kind of like we're going out into the new normal burnt out a little bit. So figuring out how to be kind 
<laughs> and discerning in the next 90 days is a really and kind to ourselves and our yeah. teams and the people we leave so you know there's a funny oh I was like, there's a funny Instagram post just really quickly that kind of caught me and I was like oh it said folks we're in a pandemic not a competition for productivity right and I was like what because I thought now is the time for me to be very productive all in adrenaline high go 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 and I did that I did that with my team and my team actually called me out on a, on a team meeting last week they said time out we've been going hard can we just catch breath and so we had to make a choice I said everybody take like Friday off everybody's taking Friday off take it off because we we responded so quickly we've been on adrenaline and now we're tired and Ellen I totally agree like we are we're tired and I had to think we're, we're not competing about productivity like this is a new thing for all of us we have to give ourselves some grace and a break as well during this time let's keep talking about teams that's that this is huge because if you're saying be kind to yourself you know we're, we're self-aware we're becoming I think more um, aware and not afraid of saying I'm tired I've heard that a lot this week, even on calls and just saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling like a hundred percent myself or the zoom, uh, calls. I'm like done with them. Or I told some of you myself this morning, I was like, Hey, I think this machine, this computer just sucks all my energy. <laughs> I don't know what's going on by the end of the day. I'm done. Like why I could be around people all day long and not necessarily feel the same. Um, again, I'm an extrovert too, but it's, it's been a very interesting season to lead a team. So let's talk about that a little. How do you lead a team? Not, this isn't normal change. How have you been leading your team through this, the last 90 days? Cheryl, what about you? Yeah, I think uh, well, everything, that, everything that comes at people, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity of what is happening right now, uh, the answer to all of those things is clarity. <laughs> And so I think we've really tried hard to be as crystal clear about what, what we need to do and then let go of what we don't need to do with our team. And I think it's done a little bit of what you're talking about, Melinda, then it's released our team to, to kind of rest when they can rest and not be sort of what else should we be about. And so uh, I think two things we've, we've really worked hard at. We've worked hard at clarifying. And, and the clarity for us has been our vision hasn't changed. Our, our vision is to bring help and hope to every marriage and every family in Canada. And that has not changed. So that's, that's our plumb line. Um, how we do that is obviously having to change, but the vision hasn't changed. So don't feel like we have to reinvent ourselves crystal clear on our vision and our mission. That's, that's the same. Um, and then I think the second thing that we've had to do is really communicate and be really transparent with our team so that, um, almost over communicate. I read somebody early on, they said, you know what, nobody is going to criticize you as a manager for over communicating with your team in this season. Now that doesn't necessarily mean more zoom calls because <laughs> they will criticize you for that. But I think just, you know, over communicating, we care about you. We're all in this together. Here's what we're working on the transparency. And so those two words have really guided us clarity and communication and as onto over communication. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ellen, what about you? I would just say amen. <laughs> you know, we, all, we really tried to do the same thing. I think that this has probably made me be the leader I need to be, <laughs> this situation, because that clarity and communication has been the same thing. And so at the beginning of, now knowing that this has not been a perfect process, but at the beginning of this, when we knew our teams were going to have to go home, I mean, one of the first things was just making sure that everyone had what they needed at home and getting that sorted out. And the second big piece was making sure we had ways to stay connected daily with each other, not just from a work perspective, but from a like, how how is this person actually doing? And being aware of that. And I think one of the very first things I told the team is that this is a season where we have to have an enormous amount of grace with each other because we're all going to have hard days and this is a totally extraordinary circumstance. So in, in our work, because of the type of organization we work with, we have to be really wise about stewarding our time and our resources. And, um, and this has been being more lenient even with the team. And so, and from that clarity perspective, like we sat down um, 
my colleague Cheryl, who's our managing director, and myself sat down with each team member and went through their allotment of time for the day and broke it down with them, said, spend this much time on this, spend this much time. And then we actually gave them a budget, a daily budget of personal development time so that they felt like they had time where they could learn something or grow and become just better at what we do so that we can serve organizations better. And so, and that has really helped. And I think the other piece, again, it's exactly what Cheryl said. It's that transparency with the team of, I mean, they know that I've, I'm juggling a lot of balls here and figuring out which ones are crystal. They also know where we're at financially. And um, we're very fortunate that um, how God, we we believed in Dave Ramsey when nobody else did. And so that's really helped position us to be really sustainable. So to be able to communicate transparently, even about finances and I mean, having a call one day with the team and saying, who is afraid of losing their job? And like, put up your hand if you're, and it was interesting to see like, who's afraid of losing their job? And to be able to speak to that then and say, okay, here's where we're at. And if you're afraid of this and, and have these different, we had a, call one two weeks ago a staff meeting and the whole staff meeting was what are you finding hard during this time of working from home and trying to brainstorm solutions with each other and this week it was what do you need to be in place to feel safe when you go back to work um like in the office and it seems premature but like this is a question that they the dignity of of just asking um what do you need is a really big thing and so to just really get a pulse at where people are at has been a really good thing like how are you using your time what do you need what's hard um and what's encouraging you too and and to so that we can encourage each other mm -hmm. that's brilliant mel how are you doing yeah. with your team um i love all what cheryl and alan have been saying i think for our team you know we're not for profit world my husband is too so the reality of losing our jobs is very, very in our face in the very beginning. And I think having the conversation with my team to say, first of all, you know, just step back for a bit. We, our CEO resigned prior to COVID-19. So you have an organization where your CEO, we don't have a CEO, you're run by sort of a C-suite. Then COVID hits, and every, there's so much insecurity. So there was a lot of insecurity. So I think for me, it was, you know, talking to my team and saying, all right, um, I know that we're worried that we're going to be losing, we could lose our jobs. What are things that we can do to add value to our us that is not just about content creation, but other things. And that's how actually we were one of the first teams in Crossroads to do a webinar. Mm -hmm. This was like weeks before we're like, well, why don't we just now do like a webinar on keeping people strong and sane. And that came out of my team out of a creative. And I'm like, great idea. And we did really well. People thought it was fantastic that we offered this resource. So I think it was the first thing was being really honest. Like here's the situation of a not-for-profit world. Second, I think it was, we said, what works for you? They said, we want to meet twice a week. Don't do too much mothering. We don't want too much of it. We don't want games. We don't want any of that. Just, you know, two times through the week, let's talk about priorities, do a devotional, but that's it. So I talked to my team because some people are going, I think, overboard where there's too much going on and others are like being really hands off. So we had to find the balance and listening to them. And then, you know, it's a lot of prayer. I'm available by text. If you need a day off, let me know if you need to, whatever you need to do. So I really felt as a leader, I had to be a way more flexible. I had to be really open. I had to be like, Hey, if you need to take a break, go for it. And I had to tell them, I trust you, you know, we're all at home now. So I'm trusting you in your work hours. Like, you know, whatever is healthy for you and your balance, then do it. But there's also things that need to be done as well. So I'm trusting you with your time management, your self-regulation, what you need to do. And that was really healthy for the team because I, I just sort of set it out as a leader. And you need to trust me with my time as well. So, um, I, you know, I would say that uh, those were a lot of different, you know, things from my team. And we're just kind of like, going along. And I think that, I think the being transparent is really key. I mean, we had to talk about budget. We had to talk about what could happen. We could, we had to talk about that. So I would say those are some of the key things that I had to do with my team, even, you know, before, but even just every, every day and every week. Um, and I'm curious to know how you led your team. Sorry, Brenda. 
how you led your team. Yeah, to yeah I, I actually was thinking about it because usually I ask all the questions and I'm like, oh, this one's so good because I lead a team of volunteers. <laughs> you just right? you yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is a good one because it's a different perspective for those that are listening that have a volunteer team. Uh, and so Carrie Newhoff has been saying for years and years already, you know, the, the importance of giving our teams that are like our staff teams, the freedom to work off site and just to watch, like he would even do these podcasts. He's like, I just like dare you, like just watch and see when you let your team work off site, just see the productivity level will increase because some people thrive it, by working outside a little bit, or they work, you know, outside of an office setting. So um, from that perspective, we've been really great as a church staff and seeing productivity levels, I think, increase anyways, because we're all, you know, just all in uh, and have radical ownership of what we're doing. But leading the volunteers was so interesting as I was navigating, oh my goodness, I can't you know, call a meeting and, and just see, see their faces. Uh, how am I going to really, and they're all over the country. Like, how am I going to actually um, minister to them? And they're doers for the most part. And now no one's like doing and they're, they're not feeling purpose filled. And so there was a bit of a crisis at the beginning of just going, Hey, everything is just going to stop right now. We're just going to halt all ideas and all projects and all, all this kind of stuff, stop and let's actually care for our families. So I think, uh, Ellen, like what you're saying, like what do you need right now for your families um, was huge to start off with, to say, I don't care as much. You know, I don't care. If I'm going to really be honest, I do not care about what we do as much as who the people are. And if they are doing well as a family and if they're actually thriving and they're okay and they're like marriages and like the homeschooling thing with kids is stressful, all this stuff in the first few weeks. Then when folks got a rhythm, probably the third or fourth week, they were reaching out saying, hey, we just like, what can we do? And so at that point, we started to have conversations of the, not just the how are you, but like, how are you really? And like, let's talk about how are you really? Again, more, putting more emphasis on the person than the doing, because that's what, we, that's kind of how we roll. It's like, let's go like full force ahead. Uh, what I ended up seeing is that people became the hands and feet of Jesus in a radical way, in a, in a like supernatural motivating way in their loneliness. And it wasn't about you know, here's the checklist of all the things that we have to do to set up an event. And here's the checklist of all the things we have to figure out and uh, all of our, you know, databases of event planning and all that stuff. Oh man, it was like, it fueled a genuine faith in folks to get back to Bible reading and uh, mm -hmm. developing their own prayer life. And it has been an absolute joy to enter in the lives of people and just listen to what is, what is happening. It made May, I think it made me a better leader to, to stop and to hear and to listen and to go, you know, what, do you, what is it that you need? Community and connection. How do you want to do this? And let the ideas flow from the, the need of the people. Um, so leading the volunteer team was very, I, I feel like it was a growth process for me. Uh, and it still is. It very much still is. I've seen people rise up that I would have never imagined would have ri risen up and, and said, you know, well, here I am. Like what, you know. This is my idea. Oh, wow. Okay, let's go and deliver cupcakes to people, <laughs> like whatever it is. Or, hey, I got to lead an alpha group because my friends need to know Jesus and I'm bringing four of them. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like this stuff opened up a Pandora's box, truly. So wow. I loved, love, love, love to think about, you know, what could be the new normal? I don't think it's going to be, it can't go back to what it was. And so I think we're going we're gonna to continually be in the season of change. It's got to be a Venn diagram of some sort. I don't know. I don't have any answers. I just you know to continue listening to our teams is essential. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've noticed that what seemed to be priority before COVID-19 is not the same priority anymore. Some things have been thrown out the window. Uh, like in my world, it was how many people are coming to an event, perhaps. Like that would be a measure of success. It, that's not even the measure of success anymore. You could have like 1,500 people sign up for a webinar. You can have 200 people. That, that, that doesn't even matter. It seems to be that 
there's this language, new language that we're learning about engagement. How are people engaging um, online? And so I guess my question is, how have you seen that in your ministries, what used to be priority now shifting to something else? Or has it remained constant? And Cheryl, you've talked about, you know, our vision has stayed the same. This is what we're, we're about. But have some priorities shifted for you? Mel, why don't you start? A fun one, a light one, was um, buying clothes and shoes at the store. <laughs> Every woman can understand that, whether you're in TV or not. That was a priority. It's a totally shifted <laughs> priority now because you can't, but also you know, shopping in your closet, seeing what you have in your own home and the needs of what you actually need has been very interesting for me. I mean, especially because I'm an extrovert, love to go out, eat out, buy stuff, buy free things and do stuff. When you can't, you realize I can paint my own nails, even though I love going to the spa. I've been able to be creative with my hair when I always went to the hairdresser. Now, listen, I love those things. And as soon as COVID-19 allows me to get out and do that, I am right in there. So I'm not saying not to do that. I'm saying that a lot of what I thought was a priority and a need, something in my life that was essential is not so essential. And what I'm realizing is, yeah, relationship with my family. Um, I think engagement, even personally, I think, I think one has been myself. I mean, you know, my, my word of this year was being present. And I think it's hilarious that my word was present. And I'm actually going to write a little blog about it because present in a time in my chaotic fast life versus present in a time where you're forced to almost be present with yourself and with your family has a a whole different meaning. So I think, um, the priority of myself and self care, I'm doing more face masks and being kind to myself a lot more, taking walks, looking up at the trees and birds, like things I never would usually see uh, because I'm too busy uh, to see them, I'm doing. Second, I think with Chris and I now working together at home, what is the balance for us in our relationship, getting to know each other on different levels and different on a different level of our marriage coming up to four years of marriage. So that's something that's been really amazing. And and just being with family, um, in a blended family, we were kind of now back and forth one week with the kids, one week not, they're with their mom. And so what does that look like for us and engaging as a family? So a uh, priority has really been interesting. The priority has shifted from home priority to me versus always sort of going out. And that's actually been, if I can be so honest, a personal thing about always wanting to be out there versus wanting to be here. So I'm really exploring that. I think that priority has really shifted. And um, what's been interesting is as much as I want to be with, you know, people, what's happened though, is I've actually been able to access my girlfriends and Chris has accessed his guy friends. Chris actually is an introvert, has more one-on-one guy Zoom calls and mentoring than he ever has. He's doing like guy Friday nights now where they bring their guitar and they hang out and they're talking about all kinds of cool guy stuff. And I'm like, that would have never happened before because everybody's so busy. And my girlfriends who are always so busy and we can only get together every quarter of the year are now we're meeting every other week to pray and encourage one another in some really tough situations. So I don't know, the priority of engagement of friendship has shifted and I have really begun to really like myself and what I'm prioritizing and what I'm focusing on. So it's, it's been a really actually, and, and it's hard to say, Anne, sometimes because this has been a very difficult time for people. But for me personally, it's actually been a very good awakening and rediscovering time for myself as a woman, as a person, follower of Jesus, stepmom and friend. So it's, it's actually been really good. It's so brilliant because, you know, there's even, I think this, I'm on a roll with Carrie Newhoff today, but uh, he said, you know, leaders can make the most horrible friends. Cause we're always go, 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 busy, 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 do, do, do. And we don't actually, we love our friends. We think we love, you know, love them and we want, yeah, you know, the best for them and we love our friendships and that kind of stuff. But the priority of being a great friend and being present, um, loving home, you know, as a, as a woman, who's a leader, this is what you're describing that leader who's always on the go mm-hmm. actually 
uh, making it intentional. This isn't about a sabbatical or Sabbath. This is about making an intentional lifestyle choice and shifting priorities. It's pre- it, this is wisdom right here. And I know it's um, like a prophetic word for some leaders that are listening in. Ellen, what's happened in your world? What has shifted that was maybe once held as treasure and important and now your priorities have shifted, whether it's in ministry or personal life? You know, <laughs> This is going to sound really funny, but not a lot has changed that way because we have very intentionally tried to build a life that is a safe life, especially with our daughter and our family, and that we get to just be like, I love being at home. I love it. So, and, and anybody, so I was the opposite of Melinda. Like I haven't wanted to cook and I am actually the person who cooks all the meals, make sure we have all the leftovers. I love to can, I love to bake. I love, um, I love all those things. I love like these, um, domestic sciences, totally love them gardening and all those things. So, I mean, at the beginning of this, I was like, I was born for this. <laughs> My mom was a home economist. Like, I was born for this. I can tell people how to make economical, healthy meals and all those things. Um, so I love that. I think what I, I actually haven't had as much time for those things because it's like being again in a startup for my business and are in the business. Um, and because because we're a, like a social enterprise as well, I feel this responsibility. So we're, it's a business, but it's a social enterprise. Like I'm not in this for the profit. If I was, I would have chosen a different, um, a different job probably. <laughs> I'm in this because of what we get to do in the world and how we get to come alongside. And so I feel so deeply passionate. I probably haven't felt this passionate about the work I get to do in a long time because you know, our time is really divided between being a family member and being a neighbor and a friend and a parent. And so this has given me a new opportunity. I'm just, you know, honestly, one of the things that has been the most amazing is how my husband has stepped up and really been a great partner. I think that I just wish men all around the world could see what he's doing. Like he, when, when this all happened, he set up his desk in my mom's bedroom here for when she comes to visit. And he set up a little desk for our daughter. And I mean, he's kind of taken the lead on the homeschooling for her throughout the day. Um, and I take my parts, but he knew he was like, Ellen needs to lead this thing. So I need to step in and do this. And so there's absolutely no way I could do what I do right now if it wasn't for him choosing to step up and so like he's been a real partner in this and um so I think we Dan and I do really well in crisis and um this just really reminded me of that that we're the kind of for whatever reason our marriage just gets better under crisis and we really kind of I feel like what is needed right now and maybe Cheryl will be like okay this is your area this is marriage but I feel like <laughs> especially spouses and co-workers, we actually need to like circle the, the, the tents right now. Like we need to kind of stand back to back. There's a common enemy and we actually have to have each other's back. So we made a pact at the beginning of this that only one of us was allowed to have a grumpy day at a time. So like if he's having a bad day, my job as his wife and his best friend is to like cheer him up, do all the things that I can, try to really come alongside him and vice versa. Because honestly, everyone right now is stressed. So we're all going to have a grumpy, miserable day. And um, we kind of had to make that. Like we had to just say, okay, we're setting up our camp. We're circling the wagons. We're protecting our family unit. We're protecting the people around us. We're protecting each other. What do we need? And Because when we do that, then we can actually serve the people outside of us better. So that's in our little camp. You want to teach with us, you guys? <laughs> I think that's great. That's a podcast right there, Cheryl. <laughs> it's like so needed right now. And, and kudos to Dan. I read a New York Times study this morning that said 40, 47% of men believe that they're the, they've become the primary homeschooler, but mm-hmm. only 3% of women agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> They have this idea that they're doing a lot more, but it's, yeah. it's not actually being seen that way. Anyway, that was a very interesting uh, survey. So good on him. Good on Dan. Mm-hmm. Cheryl, what things have shifted for you? Have, how has those priorities changed right. for you? A little bit like uh, Ellen, my, I had cancer two years ago, and that 
really shifted my priorities. And so I would say I've just kind of, kind of leaned into that e even more. Um, just really, I've been reading John Mark Comer's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's, it's just such a great book. And it's a, such a great concept that we really do our best ministry when we when we slow ourselves down, when we slow our brains down, when we actually have space to listen to God. And, and so I've really been trying to practice that. Melinda, I have some, um, I, I felt like God was asking me a year ago, year and a half ago, to go on a year long clothing fast, retail clothing fast. So for an entire year, wow. a whole year, a whole 12 months, I did not go retail shopping. I did not buy anything, any piece of clothing. And it was up in January and I was so excited that I, you know, this year was going to be, and then, you know, this COVID crisis hit. So anyway, and it, even if you get nice clothes, there's nowhere to go. So what's, what's the point? You know, who's wearing you, shoes right now? Anyway, I would say not, uh, it, my, it hasn't shifted anything in my heart. What has shifted for me, both in terms of ministry and in terms of my life, is um, realizing that I actually can do more by just slowing down and praying than mm -hmm. I can by activating all my Martha genes and, and doing things. And I mean, I know it in my head and I think God just had to use this crisis to, to slow me down enough to say, Cheryl, I just really want you to intercede for these people because there are so many broken people across this country. This crisis is, um, and Melinda, I'm so proud of you for being so transparent about there have been some hard days, but what we're experiencing is nothing compared to what some families are going through right now. And so it just breaks my heart. And so I think what's changed in me is just a softer heart and realizing that I can't fix it for them. I never could. I thought I could. I, I, I thought by teaching them the right things I could, but really I couldn't. And what I've learned is just being that, um, that prayer can accomplish things that we can't accomplish in all of our doing. So anyway, so powerful. You mentioned uh, a great resource and we're going to list out all of our resources um, that we've been talking about. Are, are there any resources that Ellen, you have been kind of either digging into or recommend? You're like a library, my friend. If I ever want like a topic, I'd be like, Ellen, do you know something about this? Or she'll be like, hey, have you heard about this? Like she, you're just, you just know so many, <laughs> know of. So what, what things right now are kind of these hot items that we should be uh, well, there's picking a book up called, reading? Well, I know. And I think, um, well, Melinda and you, Anne, both have a copy of this book that I think I sent you, Praying Women by Sheila Walsh. That has been so healthy and so helpful for a lot of women I've been talking to um, because it, this is a time when we actually do need to pray more. And yet there seems to be this, like, we don't like, what, what do you pray when you don't know what to pray? So that's a great tool. And there's a free online study that goes along with it and, and great tools. The other one, the one I've been reading is the vision driven leader by um, Michael Hyatt. It just came out right as this was all happening. And um, I don't normally read a lot of business books because I feel like my read my heart fed more than anything. But that one had a lot of um, like the first chapter was like underline, 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 underline. And so I mean that one just I really think that this is a time to be really crystal clear on vision. I know this is, keeps coming up today in this conversation but to be super crystal clear on your vision and be able to communicate it to the people around you um and i think if we could walk out with one thing it would be that clarity that cheryl was talking about like clarity 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 um because we are going to need that because i think our world is going to be increasingly confusing in the next six months because we're going into a world that we have no frame of reference for and we every single social thing that we have learned how to do since we were born is now changed and has a new level of intentionality around it so that clarity around the core things is going to be more important because i think we're going to be so distracted or tempted to distraction by just trying to figure everything out <laughs> If that's fair, I could be so wrong. I would love it if we could just go back and do everything the way we kind of did before and I don't have to learn anything more because I've been learning a lot. But 
I think we've got a lot more to learn, so. Totally. I've been using the term the next normal instead of the new normal, because I think, I don't, because the new normal to me implies that we're gonna get through this and then we'll find a new normal and we can settle into that. I actually think we're in a series of next normals. <laughs> I really do. And so I think just framing that for myself and for our team has been helpful. Sort of, yeah, we are, we'll figure this piece out and then there'll be another thing that we have to figure out after that. So uh -huh. I think it just allows us to kind of settle in and do circling back to what you said at the beginning to just take a day at a time. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, as, as we're all involved in people, you know, I think one of the things that was big was reality that, you know, they've been saying concerts, conferences, sporting events, the next 18 months are not going to happen, you know, and for churches and for the work that so many of us do, that's, that's what fundraising is about. That's what sharing our story is about. That's what, you know, our churches are about gathering people and, and gathering people is a great thing being with people. But if that can't happen, then what does that mean as far as connection? And so that's been something I've been, you know, sort of thinking through, but what, what does that look like and how, how are you going to connect creatively uh, with people? But knowing though, with technology, we can connect with people all over the world this way uh, in ways that we never thought of. Like I, I was actually laughing with my team. I said, how come we weren't doing Zoom call things like this last year? I could be, I could have been doing shows with people all over the world, but we had this thing that we had to bring them in. They had to be with us. And now I'm like, for years, we could have been literally doing TV shows with people from all over the world. And so that was some of it, like when an aha moment that the world just got really small and we can actually hear their voices. And that's a good thing. You know, I think for those moments, I think for us, we were like, wow, we can get the voices of women in Dubai, in Kuwait, in, you know, in Mumbai, in Manila, than, than when, what we were doing before. So yeah, it's an interesting time. And I think, again, one day at a time. That's brilliant. Thank you, ladies, so much. This has been such an incredible conversation. And I just want to give us one final question and then we're going to wrap up. What advice would you like a sentence or two advice to leaders that are listening right now? Mel, what do you think? Yep. I have it right here. It comes from first Peter five ten. Here's my encouragement. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And I just love that verse because suffering for some, I mean, there's greater suffering, smaller suffering, but our own suffering, it says, you know, God himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And it's not just, I think, God will, God is. And I cling to that God is continually making us strong, firm, and steadfast as we go each day. And he will never leave us, forsake us, he's with us through this. So just to be encouraged by that promise of God. Yeah. Mine, so isn't Cheryl, really, yeah. mine isn't nearly as spiritual, but that's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I was, I actually hadn't thought about, but you know, I, I will say this, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry is our med chief medical officer here in British Columbia every day, about three o'clock or two o'clock, she goes on and she gives an update to everyone. And it's like the whole province just stops like Dr. Bonnie is speaking, shut up everybody. And it's just kind of like, we all stop and listen to what she has to say. And she always ends her press conferences with um, three things. She says, be kind, be calm, and be safe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's pretty good advice for leaders all the time. Be kind, be calm, mm -hmm. be safe. And I think uh, it's, it's probably uh, not very spiritual, but I think it's good advice for me, particularly the be safe piece is like, let our people be safe with us. And I know she's talking about physically safe and safe from the uh, um, COVID-19, but I'm talking about let our people be safe with us enough to be really authentic and really um, open with, with what they are going through and, and share that with them so that the safety piece means something a little bit different. But the, yeah, the kindness piece, I think. Neil and I have been reading through the um, Jesus teaching on uh, um, the Sermon on the Mount, and it's just, it's just all about kindness. It's all about mm -hmm. humility and kindness. And you could, that would be my advice to leaders. Cheryl, that was pretty spiritual. 
Yeah. I, I turned, you saw I turned it more spiritual, right? Because, <laughs> you know, we can make a sermon on anything. <laughs> Ellen, what are your, your words of advice? I would add to that, um, be humble. Mm. Because right now, um, we need leaders that are humble enough and have enough humility to not know everything. And to be willing to learn and to be willing to be authentic and real and who are okay with saying I'm tired or the way I was doing it didn't work. Um, and we need that. We actually need leaders who are humble. One of the things, I mean, I love Bonnie Henry too. <laughs> I think from Ontario, I watch it like, cause I'm watching to see what you guys are doing. Cause we'll do it next sort of a thing. But you know, in our province, um, we've been watching Doug Ford who wasn't like very popular you know, three months ago, but, um, every day he does his talk. And one of the things that I've appreciated is that he's been humble. Like he defers to people who know more than him when he gets a question he can't answer. And he's like, I'm going to let so-and-so answer this because they're the expert in that area. Um, and he's been honest about his feelings and even with his family and what they're struggling through right now. And, and so, you know, like him or not, um, I've been learning leadership from him and, and that humble piece is really, really important. So yeah, we turned this into a political thing. I didn't mean to, but you I know. love this conversation so much because you guys are, you are safe people for me. You are humble leaders. I think your kindness just, it, it just exudes out of you. And so I love how Jesus the Jesus in you comes out in every setting, whether it's this online setting or in your ministries. And it's just, it's such a privilege to know you um, and to be able, I count myself really, um, yeah, really privileged to know each one of you. And it's an honor to co-labor with you and see God you know, advancing in our country and uh, bless our leaders. I know those that are listening are just there are so many incredible lessons that we've learned together. Um, I'm going to be posting all of our resources again that we've talked about how to contact you guys too and follow your own podcasts and your ministries so that our leaders can continue to be in touch and be blessed by the wisdom that you share. And uh, also leveragewomen.com. We have a few online events that are happening in the next month or so. Thanks again, ladies. I'm just so, so incredibly blessed. Love you guys. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Bye.